Hi, my name is Bill Kranz. I'm an irrigation specialist with the University of Nebraska, located at the Haskell Ag Lab near Concord. This particular section is going to deal with understanding crop water use. As we look at the factors that impact crop water use in general, uh, there are many factors. Some of them involve the factors of in the environment. So incoming solar radiation, uh, hot air uh, kind of thing, solar heat flux, wind, these are all environmental factors that can contribute to uh, bringing energy into the system from, uh, from the sun. As we look at the, the plant materials here, we'll talk a little bit about plant species and, and uh, particular uh, canopy characteristics in terms of leaf area index. Uh, we'll talk about uh, some of these covers that we're, we'll talk about here in a little bit. Uh, and also a little bit about plant stage of growth impact on crop water use. Lastly, we're going to talk some about uh, the irrigation regime, tillage practices and some of these kind of things, planting date, uh, how that might affect the, the uh, crop water use as we go through the growing season. We look at the terrestrial energy that's coming into our environment. Um, there's a lot of energy required to evaporate water. In fact, it takes about 600 times as much energy to evaporate water uh, compared to just heating water uh, that might be out there. And so, in general, when water evaporates uh, from the plant leaf surface, it cools the plant just like if you were the plant were perspiring. So we look at the energy coming in from the sun. Uh, basically, we've got a lot of energy coming through, and if we have cloud cover and other upper atmosphere kinds of things, some of that, that energy is actually reflected back out into the atmosphere, and some of it penetrates through and makes its way down towards the Earth's surface. And again, once we get close to the Earth's surface here, some of that energy is reflected right off of these plant leaves and goes back out and is reflected solar radiation, uh, and that that remains to cause our plants to transpire and grow is the net radiation or how much water actually uh, comes into and absorbed by the plant. So there's a bit of heat exchange if you look down down here at the bottom uh, that goes on as well um, more so during the early portion of the growing season than later on when the crop canopy completely covers it. Uh, we've got some some heat transfer here with the hot dry air uh, that might move some of that material uh, uh, air away from the plant materials that, or plant growth as you see here. Uh, the turbulence of the of the uh, wind will tend to also move some of this water up into the atmosphere uh, in much more uh, rapid fashion. So uh, when the wind increases, the tendency for water to evaporate off our leaf surface goes up. So we look at these in terms of input. Uh, certainly the sun coming in is a big thing in terms of driving our, our crop water use. Uh, our wind is there uh, and our, our also our, our heat uh, temperature that we're going to see out in the field. So we go through the growing season then. What we're looking at here is when the crop is really small, and it doesn't really matter whether we're looking at soybeans or corn in this particular perspective. Early on in the growing season, these plants are very small. Uh, there's not a whole lot of leaf area for water to come out of. Uh, and there's a large area of the soil surface that is exposed to uh, evaporation loss. Now if we have a residue on the surface, this is where that, that would come into play. If we have residue on the surface, we're going to reduce this amount of trans or evaporation that comes right off the uh, soil surface. Now uh, from the plant themselves, because we got very little leaf area here, the transpiration or water that actually moves up through the plant uh, roots and uh, plant material and out through the stomata uh, is, is a pretty small item relative to the, the uh, soil evaporation loss. As that plant grows then, we're looking at the material here that uh, develops and uh, about every three days or so we develop another leaf on corn. Uh, and so as the season progresses, we have a lot more leaf area here uh, that's going to cause water to be lost in terms of transpiration into the atmosphere. The other part that goes on here, as you can see now, what used to be a very large item in our crop water use uh, is now really small because we're shaded this leaf sur or the soil surface to the point where um, we don't get a lot of evaporation loss off of it. Uh, and the additional uh, thing is with the closed canopy like we're seeing here, uh, the wind is also kept from running across uh, the soil surface to move water out of the soil itself. Yeah, now as we look at these, uh, the crop water use from a perspective of a plant population in corn, uh, we're really looking at uh, some three critical kinds of things. And that is that theoretically when the leaf area of the corn plant gets, gets above uh, this threshold, uh, that you see here uh, of about three, um, then there's enough leaf area there to transpire water uh, at a full rate. 
And as you look at these now, the difference in plant populations between uh, the, the 45, or 44,000, uh, the 39,000, and 28,000, the big difference here is uh, there are two things. One is uh, when they actually close here, but they all have enough leaf area to transpire at a maximum rate. And so from these plant populations that we have under irrigated conditions, it's rare that plant population is going to impact our, our water use very significantly. Um, in a minor way, uh, maybe, but not, not, very, not very much relatively speaking. And later on in the growing season, when uh, the plant starts, the leaves start to senesce is what's going on here in the latter part of the growing season. Uh, this is a period where we're going to have reduced water use. Uh, and when we get to our water management side of things, we're going to suggest to you that this might be an area where we can start to hold water back uh, and use what's in the soil to get us through that last portion of the growing season. Now, as we look at the potential for ET and ET plateaus here, uh, we have leaf area index here on the, on the horizontal axis. Uh, and again, as this crop develops, it's almost a linear effect here in terms of the leaf area addition. And we're going to reach a plateau here of 3.0. Once we cross this 3.0, we're going to be at full ET all the way across here uh, until we get to, to the point where the leaf starts to senesce at the end of the growing season. So, um, in this upper plateau here, there's enough leaf area to absorb all the radiation, and that's part of the reason. Uh, and it also has enough, enough stomata there to exchange water vapor with the atmosphere around it. Uh, and so as long as water is there and adequate for that plant to, to continue to transpire at that rate, it will. If we're, we're, we don't have adequate soil moisture here, as you're seeing, uh, we're going to have some reduction in the uh, ET that's going to take place out in the field. Uh, and again, as the plant's developing here earlier in the growing season, part of this is that there's just not enough leaf area there. But the energy is there, the crop is what limits the ET uh, if we have adequate water. One of the things we often look at is the, the uh, long-term uh, crop water use for these different uh, crops. And if you develop a, a plan for uh, corn and soybeans, it might look like this. Now, these particular graphs were developed back in a period of time uh, when uh, the planting dates were different. You notice that the one for corn starts over here at the far, far left, uh, and the one for soybeans starts a, a week or two later. And these are planting date kinds of issues that take place during the growing season that maybe aren't quite so drastic today as they were back when this data was collected. Uh, but nonetheless, the, the crop water use on a long-term basis is going to have a curve like this. So during the heat of the growing season, we're going to have peak water use reached by both of these crops. Uh, and the peaks are fairly similar in terms of what that particular value is going to look like. Now, the other part of this is in the importance of monitoring monitoring your soil water content and managing your irrigation system uh, is that if we look at, uh, our, this is our long-term graph of, from the previous one, uh, and the more jagged line that you see in this particular graph now are, are more of an annual basis. So you can see here that on an annual basis these numbers go up and down based upon whether you've got uh, cloud cover uh, or we got a rainfall event that might have come through here. Uh, this might have been a really hot day here and, and then a period of rainfall and, and cooler temperatures uh, happen shortly thereafter. And so these are the kinds of things that happen on a day-to-day -day basis during a growing season that are hard to predict and it's, it's difficult to use a long-term graph to get that part done. Now, over the growing season here now, as we look at these numbers, um, the ET that's taking place out there are largely due to climate. If you think about the state of Nebraska where we have precipitation in the southeast that might be 35 inches per year, and if we go all the way out to the western part of the state of Nebraska now, we're talking about 14 to 15 inches. As you go across the state of Nebraska then, uh, we are really looking at a reduction in humidity, uh, a complete change in our climate from a subhumid over here on the eastern side to a semi-arid over on the western side. And you can see what happens here that uh, because of the humidity we have over here in the eastern part of the state, the crop ET for the season uh, for the same crop uh, essentially the same everything is considerably more over here in western part of the state of Nebraska than it is over here in the east. And that's the other part of being able to manage these systems according to the conditions that we experience out there in the field. So how do we do that then? Well, one of the ways we were uh, suggesting that might happen uh, is to utilize the uh, High Plains Climate Center um, in terms of the 
the uh, weather station network that's out there is going to give us some idea of what the reference ET is. And for the state of Nebraska, this is a reference ET is actually the ET for a, a crop of alfalfa with about 12 inches of top growth on it. So this is the kind of information that's available from the High Plains Regional Climate Center uh, that you can get uh, in a variety of places online through uh, CropWatch, uh, or you can get a subscription directly from the High Plains Climate Center to, uh, to get that information directly to your computer at home. The other way of doing this, and we don't have these weather stations everywhere, is to utilize something uh, that's a little bit more uh, or a little less technical in that we're talking about the evaporation using an atmometer. When we look at this, what we have here is a plastic tube that's filled with distilled water. Uh, and at the top up here is an evaporation or uh, the uh, Bellamy plate uh, that allows water to evaporate out into the atmosphere. And there's a little canvas cover on the top of here that uh, basically causes water to evaporate or allows water to evaporate in a similar manner to what we would expect to see from uh, the crop itself. And so as we go through the growing season, there's a sight gauge here on the side that we can measure the level of water inside this tube and get an estimate of what the reference ET is uh, using alfalfa again as a reference crop uh, utilizing the uh, ET gauge. Um, these are relatively inexpensive, a uh, little over $200 we're, we'll get one. Uh, and they're really good for an area that might be six or seven miles uh, square away from uh, wherever this installation is. Uh, there are some insulation kinds of things that we'll talk about uh, in other parts of this, uh, this presentation, uh, but uh, this ET gauge is one way to get reference ET. So both of these will give you the exact same number in terms of the reference crop ET that we are experiencing due to the environmental conditions that are out there in the field each day. Now one of the things we have as a NEB guide as to how to utilize uh, the modified atmometer here. Uh, it's available on our, our website. Uh, this particular table is included in that particular uh, uh, NEB guide. Um, and if we look at this for corn, for instance, what we have here is basically a situation where we have a crop coefficient based upon uh, the, the uh, stage of crop growth. So if we can go out in the field and stage that crop and know what we're looking at uh, in terms of the field, whether it be silking or, or a 14 leaf stage, um, we're going to get a number here that we're going to be able to convert that ET gauge number or from the High Plains Climate Center a potential number directly to an estimated crop water use. And as we change our planting dates for each individual field, uh, and maybe they're delayed planting in some fields because of other issues, uh, these, these kind of tables really come into play. And so we have the same sort of thing for soybeans here uh, and also for irrigated wheat uh, that you see here. So for instance, if we have a, a corn on uh, that is uh, eight leaf stage here, our crop coefficient that we're going to multiply our ET gauge number by is 0.51. If we have 16 leaf corn on the same day, uh, same kind of conditions, we're going to have a different plan out there because now we have twice as many leaves. And so we're going to have a situation where in most cases, uh, the, with the plant populations we plant under irrigated conditions, we're going to have ET that's full and we're going to multiply our reference crop ET by 1.1. So just as an example here, let's say that our ET gauge for the, the past week uh, gave us uh, two inches of water use. Our corn is at the 16 leaf stage. Uh, so what was the actual crop water use during that period of time? The way we do that again is to take our reference crop ET, which is the two inches we were talking about just on the top of this image, and we're going to multiply it by the crop coefficient from that table. And we're going to end up then with what the actual crop water use was for that particular day. Now the crop coefficient, if you remember, we just looked at uh, was 1.1. So we take our two inches of water use times our 1.1 and we get the 2.2 inches of crop water use uh, for that particular uh, period of time, that one week period. Uh, so this might be an indication of how much water the irrigation system should have to replace uh, and depending on where we are in the growing season that you might apply more or less than that particular amount. Also in the, that particular NEB guide is this table uh, where we have uh, actually have weekly ET across the top in terms of uh, changes in the water level of our ET gauge. So if we go back to our, our 2.0 here and we go down the table uh, over here on the, on the left hand side we have stage of growth 
uh, that you see here, and we get back down to our, our V16 or our 16 leaf stage, and we then go horizontally across uh, to where we intersect with our two inches of water use, and you can see we come up with the same numbers. So for some of these, they also already have the uh, calculation made in terms of how we might estimate the crop water use for that particular day. The other part of it is there are tables like this for other crops, for soybeans and for, uh, for wheat as well. Um, so there are a number of things. The other part of this, as you can see up here, it gives you a little idea of what the plant looks like uh, at different growth stages. Now, the important thing is here that you don't have to remember all of what I just told you. Uh, we have this NEB guide that's available on our website that you see here at the Nebraska Egg Water Management uh, Network website, uh, and it deals with the use of atmometers to uh, develop an irrigation management practice.